there, everybody. Welcome to episode number 537 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. How about we talk about IoT design acceleration? My guest this week is Lou Ludostansky from Avnet, and we're talking all about the what, why, and how of Avnet's IoT Connect, Avnet's new IoT platform as a service. We examine the challenges that IoT Connect is looking to solve and the details of Avnet's IoT Connect solution, Accelerator Software. Also this week, I investigate a new algae energy harvester developed by a team of researchers from the University of Cambridge. Yep, you heard me right, algae. But before all of that algae business, please welcome Lou to Fish Fry. Hi, Lou. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Amelia, for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so we're talking about IoT Connect today, which is all about accelerating IoT development. So, Lou, first, tell me about the challenges that IoT Connect is looking to solve. I think the first issue in IoT, before you can even start implementing IoT, is having a platform that connects your devices and gives you access to the data on those devices. And so if you're going to build your own, that's the first major challenge. And a lot of people use open source or they use a hyperscale cloud IoT services from Amazon or Microsoft, no longer Google, by the way, or they buy their own and they can buy one from somebody who's used open source or they can pay a consultant to build them one or what have you. The problem with all of that is it's just not scalable because all of these different platforms have devices and applications to connect to them that only connect to that one instance that they've created or they've bought. So scalability becomes a very big problem. Imagine in the PC world, if everything had a different operating system and every program and every device that connected to a PC was a one-off and you had to re-engineer everything every time. What we're trying to do with IoT Connect is we're trying to create an IoT platform and an environment that maximizes your ability to connect to either AWS or Microsoft IoT services, because we think they're going to be the predominant services over time and the only two survivors. And imagine being able to do that the same way every time. So we pre-integrate our supplier technology for our OEMs so that once we've worked with suppliers to work that optimal integration for all their different components, that it only has to be done once and other customers can leverage that. And therefore, really creating an ecosystem around AWS and Microsoft kind of being controlled by our middleware software. We call it our software accelerator, IoT Connect. So Lou, what features are included in IoT Connect? So the features include uh, our secure end-to-end device management services in this platform. We support multiple user journeys, including basic developers or experienced developers of web and mobile applications, IT data users, data analysts, and AI developers. IoT Connect also includes a GUI interface that's a console for managing infrastructure, users, devices, permissions, and rules and notifications. We also have multi-tenant environment to support true enterprise implementation of organizational hierarchies and user segmentation. We also provide in this uh, package a dynamic dashboarding for fast visualization, and we make this available on both PaaS and SaaS models on both AWS and Microsoft IoT service platforms. So that's pretty much the service aspect of IoT Connect. Fantastic. Now, I also saw that you guys have IoT accelerators for a variety of different markets. I think I saw 16 listed on your website. So tell my audience more about these accelerators. To be able to come up to speed fast and be able to do some POCs and start ideating about what your particular application would look like, we've created some frameworks with some basic KPIs for different industries so that we can get right on and immediately show you what things would look like and make accessible to you the source code so that you can start your journey with something that's already pre-built. But like most things, applications are very specific to customers. But some of the areas that we're, we're in are smart factory, smart healthcare, smart office. We have asset monitoring, which is a basic air quality monitoring warehousing, connected worker, fleet management. We also do some things around cell tower monitoring, energy and facility monitoring, 
agriculture and fresh produce monitoring. So these are all packages that have screens that come up that manage particular KPIs and, again, allow customers to ideate on what modifications they might need for these applications so they don't have to start from scratch. That makes sense. Now, Lou, IoT security is a huge topic these days. And I saw recently that you guys have collaborated with Microchip in this realm. This uses Avnet's IoT Connect solution accelerator software, right? Yes, it does. And really what we're doing, Amelia, is we're working with each of the suppliers to enable the technology that they build from a hardware standpoint. So all of the microcontroller manufacturers realize that security is going to be very key to a microcontroller market in the future because everything's going to be connected and everything has to be secure. So they've gone ahead and built a lot of hardware, both in their microcontrollers and separate devices, which are really secure elements, which house identities. And really, when you start talking about the necessary security to have in in an IT implementation or any kind of IT implication, it all starts with security, knowing who you're talking to and validating who you're talking to is the right person. So they make these devices that house these identities, but there's no way for customers to manage those unless they do significant development software-wise, embedding this software into their other platform. And we work with people like Microchip and other suppliers to make our software compatible to managing identities in their hardware. So by that way, they can compete on their proprietary hardware that provides different levels of securities in different ways. And then we can make sure that we enable suppliers and customers that use their products to uh, actually implement their security. All right, Lou, it's time for your off-the-cuff question. Now, I know you were at Embedded World recently, so tell me about your experience, and is this a revitalization of conferences as we know it? Yes, this is the biggest and best and most vibrant conference I've been to since COVID. I was there last year, and I was there pre-COVID, and there was a lot of enthusiasm and energy. We had a great show at Avnet. We were in the Amazon and Microsoft booths with IoT Connect. We also had our Avnet Embedded, our Abacus, our EBV, and our Silica booths that had multiple IoT demonstrations in it. We were also in uh, NXP's booth. So it was really, really good. And the weather was really nice. And the food was fantastic. I got to have some of my favorite Bavarian pork knuckles that I always get when I go to Nuremberg and Munich. It was a grand slam for all of us. I love it. And I hope to see you there next year. (laughs) Well, Lou, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. And thanks again for having me, Amelia. Have a great day. Did I say algae energy harvester? Why, yes, I did. And get this. This new algae energy harvester design, built by a team of researchers from Cambridge, was able to power a microprocessor for over a year without any help from humans. Okay, so why algae? Well, it's kind of amazing. It can remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. It can purify wastewater, produce hydrogen, and most importantly in this case, generate electricity through photosynthesis. In a way, algae is a perfect, natural, efficient solar cell because it can convert sunlight into chemical energy and water and carbon dioxide into organic molecules and in the process, produce electrons which can be collected and used to power electronic devices. So, what are we talking about when it comes to this new energy harvester? Well, this team started with a capsule the size of a AA battery, so pretty small. And in that capsule was a species of blue-green algae. From there, they simply used an aluminum electrode to power an ARM Cortex M0+. That's it. And for the 12 months of this experiment, this capsule was left in a domestic, semi-outdoor environment. Which makes me think a porch of some sort, maybe? And that little capsule was able to power that ARM Cortex M0+, without issue, and without any assistance from the team. Another cool part is that because the algae doesn't need to be fed, it creates its own food from photosynthesis. 
this device can actually continuously produce power even during times when it's dark. That's because the algae processes some of its food when there is no light, and this continues to generate an electrical current. So admittedly, the amount of energy produced by this tiny capsule is pretty small. But this team contends that it could be a great way to power a variety of IoT designs. Professor Christopher Howe in the University of Cambridge Department of Biochemistry, joint senior author of this paper, explains the possibility like this. He says, the growing Internet of Things needs an increasing amount of power, and we think this will have to come from systems that generate energy rather than simply store it in batteries. Our photosynthetic device doesn't run down the way a battery does because it continually uses light as the energy source. As you can imagine, this project was a collaboration between the University of Cambridge and ARM. ARM Research developed the ARM Cortex M0 Plus test chip, built the board, and set up the data collection cloud interface as well. So, are we going to see new algae energy harvesting designs in the future? I think we might. If this new device is any indication, the ability to use algae to power IoT designs might be close at hand. So, if you want even more information about this energetic study, <laughs> I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash EE Journal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. <laughs> and you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, please leave me a review on that podcasting platform of your choice. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, -E at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of June 23rd, 2023, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs>